You could be so much more. Welcome to church. We are here today to talk more about how we could be so much more in the faith. You know, again, as we've talked about last week and as we're moving on towards Pentecost in this uh, series, is to really help us to identify and realize that there is so much of our foundation uh, that is bound up in the book of Genesis that helps us to understand salvation in a greater way. My purpose for this is to provide a, f- a foundation of faith for you to be able to understand how to understand the gospel and how to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. So this series will progress uh, as we get along to Pentecost in June. And so as we do this, I want to recap a bit from last week so that we can know where we're launching off here. I would mentioned last week that if, if uh, the creation account in Genesis is myth, well, tied into that is the creation of Adam and Eve. If Adam and Eve aren't real people, and if they didn't really actually sin, it's just mythological sort of stuff, uh, then that means that sin is not actually hardcore real. And that also means then that we are not culpable for it, at least not in a, in a way that we need to do something about it, that there's just a broken world. And that does, that what that does is it undermines the cross absolutely immediately. So I gave an example of talking about how uh, it is defensible to talk about that Genesis is an accurate historical account of not just our salvation, not just sin, but that of the world. Why? Well, because one, God is identifying and letting his people know who are leaving Egypt and going into the land of Canaan, he's letting them know where they came from. And so if God's letting them know where they came from to build a country on eventually salvation and then eventually the resurrection, why would he build that upon a lie? Consider the people in the Exodus, the ones who left Egypt and going into, into the land of uh, promise. That the Genesis was the only book that they knew. That was the only thing they knew about their history. So if it's all a lie, if it, you know, them going in there was based upon a promise given to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. So if Genesis isn't real, the promise isn't real. So why are the people going to the promised land if the promise isn't literally real? They, of course, very clearly believed that it was literally real. Further, I recognized and, and revealed in summary, and by the way, I'd spend years teaching all of the ins and outs of this so that you can understand that these messages are a summary of the data that we have. This goes still much, much deeper. So if you're interested in being a student of the reliability of Scripture, then uh, I, I recommend that we get together and dive deeper. So as that, as that continues, I, I really laid out last week what it meant to be... Um, uh, you know, a long ages believer in the world uh, versus a young earth creationist. And I understand, I even give credence that both are somewhat plausible. And what I mean is this. So those who have a very old view of the universe would hold to a naturalistic view only. That means that they believe that only natural processes are responsible for what we see in the universe. And that is a huge assumption. If you want to know why that's such a huge assumption, I encourage you to watch last week's message. But nonetheless, if, it, if you start with omitting the supernatural events that are mentioned in Scripture, then yeah, you need a lot more time to get the erosion that one flood would cause. You know, we think about it. A global flood would cause massive amounts of erosion that you would find fossils laid out all over the whole earth laid down by water. And that's exactly what we find even up to the highest of mountain peaks. And whereas if you didn't believe in that flood, you would need a whole lot more time for regular erosion to be able to come up with those amounts of erosion. And so if you have a naturalistic worldview, then yeah, it makes sense that things look very old. But if we know that there is a natural word to which God had done supernatural and huge cataclysmic things, then we know that that's going to have effect on a solely naturalistic worldview. And, uh, and so with that, we do believe, I believe in science. I love science. I believe we're just figuring out what God had uh, put together. But I also recognize that God's supernatural hand has been on his creation. So in the sense of saying, like, if we could take a time machine back to 30 seconds after Adam and Eve were created, I could ask you, how old are they? And you'd probably say, well, they're fully grown. They haven't aged really yet, so they're probably 18, 25 years old. And if I then told you, no, they're 30 seconds old, you would be surprised and push back at me. Why? Because you're only looking from a natural point of view and not a supernatural view. So God made mature trees. God made mature people. God made a mature universe. So if you don't believe in the supernatural creation and you're looking out on the cosmos and saying, okay, well, it's going to take light 13.5 billion years to get from there to here. So therefore, that must be how old the universe is. I understand that. It makes perfect sense. I used to be an evolutionist because that made perfect sense if you're only trying to explain things from a natural point of view. But then when you're introduced to a supernatural God, I'm like, well, couldn't he have made a mature universe? that we are observing as mature, the same as Adam would have picked a fruit that is also only (laughs) like one day old. Uh, You know, it's really interesting to, to, to look at that. And that's not using God as the gaps where we insert God to replace what we know about science. No, it's science and God together. 
God gave us this prophetic word so that we would know where we came from, so that we could look at the things around us and see that God made a perfect world and we botched it. So that when we look out on the world and we see that, what, why would, look at all this bad that's happening. Like, God, what's going on? And he goes, I told you, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, 1, 2, and 3, I gave you a perfect world and I handed it over to you and you botched it. But I love you. and I'm offering you salvation through my son, Jesus Christ. This is really important because even the prophecy that Jesus fulfills is the one that's given to Adam and Eve in chapter 3 where God says that the serpent will strike your heel, uh, but he will crush, the seed will crush his head. That was a promise given to Eve and Jesus fulfills that in crushing the death, uh, the death in hatred and the person of Satan by Jesus Christ. And so we recognize that the cross is the biting of the heel. It is a temporary pain, but that the resurrection showed the power that Jesus had that absolutely crushed the power of the enemy. So now moving on, if, again, so I don't need to teach you evolution. You already know that. I knew that growing up. Uh, in fact, when I was even in university, I was questioning different things. And I remember a guy asking me, what are you, a Bible thumper? Why are you? And I'm like, I'm like, I had no idea how Christianity I had nothing, no idea about Genesis at that point. And I remember scratching my head wondering, what does Christianity have to do with trying to figure out that this guy's way of saying that evolution works is wrong? Because um, I was questioning his, uh, his status on saying how evolution can work. And I emphatically do not believe in evolution. I absolutely respect those that believe in long ages. If they have a naturalistic worldview, I'd say they're missing out by leaving God out of the equation. And, but when it comes to evolution, evolution means uh, increase of genetic material. When you think about it, so other than the fantasy belief that everything comes from nothing, evolutionists must also say then that everything came from one single-celled organism. You want to talk about inbreeding, everything happened to come from one cell, that means all of us are just diversification of that cell. That's impossible because that would mean every piece of genetic material that is on the earth and in everybody, organism likewise, uh, was found in that one, uh, with that one single cell which would be absolutely impossible for that, that, that amount to happen. That would be such a unique and powerful creature that it would be nothing less than God himself. And so I want to encourage you with that, that if we, you know, there, to find out what is a mechanism that a simple single-celled organism with very few genes could end up evolving into us. Well, the, the, the old theory of original was that of natural selection. And that was that if, um, if something happened to a particular population of, of, say for example, this was the one given in high school, or sorry, in university, in biology class was, now imagine they're out in the plains in Siberia that there is a pack of wild dogs. Uh, some of them have thick fur, some of them have medium fur, and some of them have uh, light fur. And he says, so suppose that there is a, um, suppose that there is a really cold winter and all of them die except one kind, which one lives? And so correctly, all the students say the ones with the thick fur. And he says, correct. Now that is an example of evolution. That is an example of uh, they became more specialized to thrive in the environment that they were in. And I put my hand up and I said, yeah, but that came at the loss of genetic material. You know, if, if a heat wave comes the next summer, they're all going to die off because they can't evolve to short hair because all the short hair genes have been eliminated. And he got cross with me saying, what are you, some sort of Bible uh, thumper? And I didn't even know what the word Bible thumper meant. But I was just questioning because I thought it didn't make sense. I would argue that that is adaptation. But adaptation doesn't add genetic material. Adaptation separates. You know, there's adaptation even within human beings. For example, the reason why I am pale is my ancestors had moved to the north where having lots of melanin in our skin, there's only one gene for skin color and that's melanin. We're all the same color. It's just a matter of how much is, is needed. But to get the vitamin D from the sun, our skin had to lighten in order so that we would not die of sicknesses. And yet those who would go to equatorial regions and live under the sun, uh, their melanin would get supercharged. So that is an adaptation, not evolution. In the same way that uh, people that would grow up in desert regions, uh, you know, say in the you know, Nevada area and the Grand Canyon area, and those who live in sub-Saharan Africa and those who live in, say, Saudi Arabia, that it is known that they have more prominent noses. Well, why is that? Well, it's because you lose about 10 times less water breathing through your nose than your mouth. Why? Because your mouth is always producing lots amount of saliva. So if you're breathing through your mouth, you are putting out all of your moisture into this dry desert air and you're going to dehydrate faster. So if you are in a desert, you want to have a sizable nose so that you can do your business without breathing through your mouth. So if you ever find yourself in the desert and there's no water nearby and you need to make a long journey, uh, walk at a cadence to which you can walk properly by just breathing through your nose and be tempted to not breathe through your mouth. So those are adaptations. 
In the same way that we learned that the Arctic hare has very small ears, and yet the Mexican hare has very long ears, because it helps them to cool down with the veins going through. Those are adaptations. Those are the rearranging of existing, uh, um, of existing genes. There's no additional gene happening there. We must also understand more of what happens when it comes to how genes behave and mutate. Because they'll say, well, don't, don't things mutate and become better? Uh, yes, of course they do. You know, but things mutate as we can observe under a microscope. You know, it sounds, it sounds great to say that, hey, genes can mutate and then become better. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that when we look at under the microscope with observable science, we can see that mutations are 10 times more harmful than they are good. And someone would say, well, yeah, isn't that the 10% that's good? Isn't that enough? Yeah, surely there's lots of death, but that goes, no, but there's 10 mistakes in one, you know, and 10% that are good um, are in the same organism. It's not like there's 10 organisms and nine are bad and one is good. It's no, there is death bound up in the whole thing. And so the question would be like this, if you are making money and you lose $9 over nine days and then make $1 on the 10th day and then you lose $9 the next nine days and then you gain $1 the next and you stay on that trajectory, how long are you going to be before you're a millionaire? Never, you're gonna go bankrupt quite quick. And that is what we see in the world today is we see that the world is wearing out, that there is a de-evolution, if you will. Now, some people would argue saying, but we li we're living longer and we're healthier than ever. And you know, so aren't we, it doesn't it look like we're evolving. No, our natural habitat has gotten a lot better, you know, and our lack of inbreeding has happened. Did you know that even today, 20% of marriages in the world are seen as at least two with first cousins? And that is not good for the gene pool. So we understand why people are becoming healthier is because they are not marrying within their own clan anymore. That the immigration and migration around the world has allowed the gene pool to diversify and so therefore get stronger with the existing genes that are there. Because when you have diverse genes, the bad genes have a tendency to be pushed down further and the other ones seem to uh, go more. Plus our nutrition has increased. Just by being uh, sharing information around the world, our nutrition has allowed us to take advantage of all the growth that our genes would formally allow. That's why we're actually getting taller as a species is because we are, have good medicine uh, and good vitamins that we give to women when they're pregnant instead of them just eating corn porridge for three meals a day, you know, 200 years ago, so that our bodies can develop to their proper. So it's not evolution, we're just able to take care of ourselves more. And, uh, and with medical science allowing us to live longer, but we're still not passing the ages that we see in the book of Genesis, which we'll get to. So as I'd like to point out, the mutation is the number one thing that people are saying how evolution happens, but yet we do not observe it under the microscope. It just does not happen. Even things like superbugs that are resistant to antibiotics are basically deformed. So they're so deformed that they can't ingest the antibiotics. And so therefore that's why they're resistant to them. It's not because they can take it on and they're stronger. It is because they're so weak, they can't even absorb it in. And if you put uh, superbugs uh, in, in a little war with regular bacteria, the regular bacteria would eat them to bits. In fact, there's uh, different experiments going on now of, of when people have a super bug, is should we then infect somebody with the regular bug so that, that regular bug would take uh, a few days to overtake the body, which would overtake the bad uh, virus, the super bugs, then you could then with the elimination of the super bug that the regular bug can then be treated with antibiotics. Those are still in study, so don't take that as absolute science for me, but I'm just giving that as an example that we do know if, by fact that super bugs are not all that super. So let's get into a couple questions that is really begged out of Genesis chapter two and chapter three. And why don't I read Genesis chapter two verses four onward because we got up to verse three last week. And then I'll begin to explain then how could everyone on earth come from just Adam and Eve? And then when the flood happened 1500 years later, how on earth genetically could people come from only eight people? Isn't that inbreeding? Isn't that gonna be detrimental to our society as you mentioned uh, just earlier? and I'm gonna have a really good answer for that. So let's buckle up and read the rest of chapter two and go into chapter three. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and had no shrub was on, had yet been on the field that appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And now uh, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put man that he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye. They were good for food. In the middle of the garden was a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. 
There it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was the Pishon. It wound through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold in that land is good. Aromatic resin and oxen are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, and it runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden and to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man will call each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken from man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So we learn here, there's, I could do like five different sermons just on this chapter, but I'll focus on a few of them. First is that there's details that are not found in other uh, creation myths of competing religions, where they're all usually bombastic and all heaven-related, where this is very earthly. Talking about rivers and where they're placed, what kind of uh, elements you'll find there, that is not in any other kind of literature like that. So this is being written as if it was literal. And so some people would even say, uh, skeptics of the Bible would say chapter 2 seems different than chapter 1, and so therefore they're two different creation myths. Why does the Christianity have two different creation myths? And the question is, no, it's not. One is a summary, and the other focuses on humanity. So one focuses on the glory of God in creation, chapter 1, and then chapter 2 expounds upon humanity. Remember last week I talked to you about that humanity is the chief of all of God's creation. So it'd be much like if you went on a week's vacation and you came back and you told me a paragraph about every day that you spent. But then you continue on saying, but you know what, on this particular day, this is what happened and you went on for a very long time. That's kind of, you need to understand it in that light. So we understand that there are very strong particulars, that it's then again tied to creation. So again, if creation is, is uh, not true the way that it is written, then Adam and Eve are not true because guess what? They're made right in there. And in fact, even when it comes time to defending, uh, so, so many years later, Jesus is being asked, is it right to divorce your, your wife? Can you divorce her for any and every reason or only if she's adulterous? That's found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 4. And Jesus answers by quoting Genesis chapter 2 here when it says, haven't you read that the Creator made them male and female? Therefore, what God has put together, let no man separate. Wow, that's incredible. And so he's quoting that as actual, if that was mythology, then why would Jesus use something that is fake to try to defend something that he thought was very important in his day? So many thousands of years later, Jesus took Genesis chapter two literally, and I think we would do well to take it literally as well. In fact, by Jesus then saying what the created order was, that helps us to understand every area of uh, sexual purity in relationships, that God has made us male and female, and he's designed us to be together for life, and he's designed us to be a family, and he designed even the church to be an expansion of that family, that the way that we operate is very family-like, that even then, so the churches get together in the sense of a community that you would call clans or tribes, that they would also work after the family. And then even after that, the nationalistic understanding of what Israel was, was based upon the family unit that originated in Genesis chapter 2. Again, if you take out Genesis chapter 2, it all falls apart. This is why it's important to have this as our foundation of our faith. God is good, and he's revealing his word to us. Let us stand on the rock. So with this, Jesus said, what God has put together, let no man separate. Yes, we believe there is grace when people have deviated or uh, someone has decided uh, without your permission to end a relationship in a bad way. And we don't wag our finger here for people who, because uh, you know what, we all have done wrong. And we need the grace of each other and the friendship of each other for us to get back on the road on the right path. So what I'm concerned about isn't your past. I'm concerned about your future. So let's live this life together and see how we can righteously move forward from here, from the difficulties that we have gone through in life. God can heal us 
and put us back on the right path without missing a single beat. So beyond in chapter two, we learned that creation was very dedicated, very thoughtful and very purposeful. We learned that also the creation of uh, Adam and Eve were also very forceful. We even learned too that it is Adam that God put enough creativity and smarts in Adam that he can name all the animals. Now also remember that we only have the tens of thousands of different species today simply because of, remember all that sorting out of genes that we talked about. We have 200, 300 breeds of dogs, most of which were invented in the last few years by Chihuahua, for example, in Chihuahua, Mexico is a province. They took small dogs and mated them with small dogs and then mated them with smaller dogs and all that until we had this anxiety riddled little creature that we called the Chihuahua. And, uh, and so as we consider all the different species or subspecies that we have made, we need to understand some people say, oh, there's no way that he could even come up, even if he had names already written for him, he couldn't ascribe them enough to all those people on one day. But literally, if you took the subgroups, so instead of being like 300 different kinds, you'd have canine. You wouldn't have all the different kinds of cats and tigers and cougars and whatever else. You would have the feline kind to which they would all go out to then sort out their genes to make other people. And, uh, and we wouldn't have uh, all the different species of birds. So you'd have very few. So if you look at the actual subspecies of the ones where uh, they can mate with each other is basically it. Um, that can help us to understand what a species is. And that would only take him about an afternoon if he could come up with a, uh, a word every so often. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not impossible. Next is we learned that she comes, Eve comes from his flesh. So he's the original creation. She comes from his flesh, but it was supernatural by God. Uh, I think that's a lot cooler than being made out of dirt. I'd rather be made out of a human rib than an, out of dirt. But nonetheless, that's the way, that's the way that it is. And uh, so they are one flesh, and this is how God determines it and how he wants our families to function. So beyond that, Adam recognizes that she will be the mother of all the living. And this is where people say, if they were the only ones to give birth, that means that all the multiple children they would have had, we only know of three mentioned in scripture, but it does say that they had many, many other children. Case in point, the, the world record for a woman having babies in recent history is 76 babies, mostly through uh, twins, triplets, and quadruplets. One lady, 76 kids, that's nuts. Uh, we know in the old years that having 20 kids, 15, 20 kids was actually the norm before there was contraception and, and planning and things like that. And uh, so as we, as we understand it, if Adam and Eve lived 10 times longer, there is no reason they couldn't have had dozens, if not even potentially hundreds of children. And yes, that means the second generation would have had to have married each other to have children through them. Now, what you might ask is saying, well, that's incest. That's bad. How on earth could we all come from that? And, uh, and so then if we go to, they, they lived along where people lived into the 900s until the time of the flood. And then we learned 1500 years that after the flood, it's not a sharp drop uh, that would insinuate maybe they just understood time differently. And it's not, it couldn't have been an atmospheric change because Moses, sorry, Noah lives 365 years past the flood. So if it was environmental, if it was calendar based or any other instantaneous thing, then he would have only lived 36 years after the flood, but he lives 360. He actually outlives his third great grandson. So we're watching a genetic decay that is happening because Adam had three sons and his uh, do three daughters-in-law are the ones who repopulated the earth. So yes, in that scenario, siblings were not required, uh, but first cousins, yes. And so why would first cousins be a problem, but sisters and brothers not be a big problem back at Adam? Well, the big difference is this, Adam and Eve were perfect. The reason why incest is bad, and by the way, can you tell me when the incest laws came in, uh, in the Bible, when it was no longer acceptable for that to happen? Put it in the comment section. And it was a long time after this. Why? Because humans had degraded and God's like, okay, enough. Is, uh, it wasn't taboo then because nobody knew anything different. And because Adam and Eve were perfect species, they had no defects to pass on that would then give birth defects to their kids. Case in point, think of this. If uh, there is siblings that have a child today, I know it's gross to even be talking about it, but that's just the world we live in. If they are both math geniuses, but they both have a uh, recessive gene of a major birth defect, then the chances of that child also being a math genius go astronomically higher, as well as that now recessive gene is now gonna become dominant and that person's gonna be very disabled. So we recognize that what happens is what, uh, 
we have what we call the double helix in DNA, and our, our DNA matches up with our spouse when we have a child. And if we have a good gene that's in the same place, for example, if two tall people have a child, uh, the two talls kind of make it even more so that the child ends up being even taller. We understand things like that, but the same thing works with the bad traits. So for example, where I might have a gene that is say Down syndrome or uh, who knows what, it would be in a similar place to a sibling or another close relative. So then if there was a child made from that, gross, uh, that it would then become dominant instead of recessive. Did you know that you have a lot of bad recessive genes in you? And they are thankfully with a diverse gene pool, they are kept down and possibly even eliminated. But if we are to procreate with uh, our siblings or close relatives, those defects are in similar place, so then they come to the forefront. That's why incest is bad, and that's why incest was not a problem for Adam and Eve's kids, because they were the very first copies of humanity. And so therefore, their gene pool was perfect. And so that's why that wasn't a problem for them, but it's a problem for us. Uh, furthermore, to think of that, uh, everyone who is probably older than 30 has used a photocopier. Everyone's just using scanners and printers now for younger, but remember taking a photocopy and then photocopying the photocopy. And if you take the photo, that photocopy out and photocopy it again, we realize that mistakes build up along the way, somewhere to the point it becomes illegible. So for the first 1,500 years of humanity, they were making copies, but it wasn't affecting their age yet. So by the time we get to Noah and his sons, they would have accumulated uh, some copying mistakes in their gene code, but has not affected their longevity yet. And so what happened is, is with uh, the whole world being cut off and only eight being able to repopulate the world, we see that uh, that would have been a first cousin situation, and that is very likely why we see uh, going from 900 to 100 years of age is much of a curve, and then it plateaus out as we diversified out. That curve, indicates that it's a biological reason. That because now that there is uh, inbreeding and that the person, the strong 900 year old now uh, is degrading that after four or five generations, we plowed, plateaued out to 90. What is interesting is that there is a disease called, the, in our day and age, called prejoria. And it is a rapid aging disease to which a nine year old child, unfortunately, looks like a much smaller 90 year old person. They just age so fast, it's a, it's a very terrible disease. And so as we are trying to find ways to slow down the aging process for them, what is interesting is that technically from Noah's point of view, we have prejoria compared to him. So it'll be interesting to see that if we can ever crack that case to figure out how to slow them down 10%, that maybe we can slow us down as well too. There are billionaires, most billionaires have their hands in living longer because um, they believe that the gene code can make us live longer, and they look at cases of prejoria, and the hope to fix them could actually make us live longer as well, too. And uh, it is interesting. I mean, if you looked at billionaires and what they're doing to try to stay alive, um, it, it's a pretty interesting rabbit hole to dive down. And, uh, and it makes sense, too. You know, we see young billionaires out there and think that somehow there's lots of young billionaires, but truly, the, the average person who becomes a billionaire, they don't make that milestone until their 70s. And so they want to live longer, of course, than to enjoy what they have uh, accumulated. Anyway, that's a side note. But what I want to get at to you is even to explain a little bit further using a Punnett square. Now, a Punnett square is uh, used in genetics to help us to understand, uh, going back to that fur incident that I mentioned in university with, uh, the, with the, uh, the wild dogs. So if you had, whenever there's something that is medium, uh, that usually means that they have a, a dominant and recessive gene in that trait that comes out medium. So if you have wavy hair, you would likely have a dominant gene of, of um, uh, curly hair and a recessive gene of straight hair resulting in a middle match of this. And I'm gonna pop this up on the screen so when you put those together, so if you had, for example, two medium haired dogs, uh, and you're gonna see that representative on the screen here right now, then you, what you see is that uh, each have a capital F, I'll say that for fur, and a, and a small F for fur, because there's usually two sets. I mean, this expands because the genetics is a whole lot more bigger than this, but this will give you a, a simple algorithm, the simplest of the Punnett squares. And so if both parents are middle, are, so just keep looking at this uh, graph here, if both uh, parents of these dogs are, uh, have middle genes, they're also gonna have a dominant and a recessive each. So if you match up each of those boxes, you're gonna see in the top left corner that you're gonna have a capital F and a capital F. You're gonna see if you move to the right, as you match those up, you're gonna see the dominant match with the not. So then you have capital F, small f. Then you're gonna go down to the bottom left, 
and match up the capital B with the recessive B from the mother, and then there you have a capital B and little b. And then in the bottom right, you're gonna see as you match up the little b's and the little b's. So what does that mean? That means if they were to have, if that uh, um, system were to have, say, 100 pups over a course of many years, those parents would then have 25% uh, would be really furry, 25%, uh, like on the bottom right, would be have all the recessive, so therefore they'd have really thin fur, and then the, uh, the two on the bottom left and in the upper right would have the medium fur just like their parents. So this is what I was getting back uh, at university when, when we said if only the capital Fs survive, there's no little Fs to ever uh, adapt back. So it's a loss of genetic information, not a gain. And, uh, and so with this, this also represents with things like the amount of melanin in our skin. So if we had melanin being dominant in recessive, uh, mine is obviously recessive. I do have some to maintain brown hair and things like that. And uh, that we're all the same color here on the earth, that we would say that, that if we use that same Punnett square, but used melanin, we would understand then that if Adam and Eve embodied all of the genetics that we have around the world, that would mean that they were likely very middle brown. And uh, so not white like us, not necessarily black, but a good solid brown. And so with that, that'd be, say, a big B and a little b, each of them on each side. So as we look at a Punnett square in that sense, what we'd end up having then is we would have the upper left would be capital B, capital B. The bottom right would be little b, little b. And then uh, as we uh, then see the bottom left and the top right would have a capital and so a dominant and a recessive. What that would mean is that uh, thousands of years later, it would be a witness, if that was true, if they were both middle brown, then we would expect that 25% of the population of the earth would be light colored, 25% of the earth would be dark colored, and 50% of the earth, the 225s, uh, would be middle brown. And that is exactly what we see around the world. So I think it's incredible that we are now you know, able to deep dive into all of uh, genetics to be able to show really what God has already done and how this underpins and says that there is no reason to need to believe in an exclusively naturalistic worldview, that we know that God is an incredible creator. This is nature that we're looking at here. God made an incredible creation, but he also has supernatural effects on it. I'd also like to point out, again, that if, they, if people say that it's impossible for perfect people to have their children have children together, then I'd like to say, well, you know, you're uh, saying that from millions of years of inbreeding uh, that would have happened and everything coming from a single cell, that's ultimate inbreeding. You know, um, it, it, it makes it really fall apart and seem so uh, absurd that uh, humanity could evolve to this level, that all of creation could evolve from one simple little organism. Uh, it's really just fantasy. It's really, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have a leg to stand on. Further, here's what all scientists, those who believe in supernatural and natural, and those who only believe in natural agree upon. Back in the late 1900s, code for 1990s, that uh, the Human Genographic Project was initiated, and it went to go do swabs of every type of people group on the planet, and they really spared no effort. They went to the deepest jungles, the far most remotest islands, they went as far north as they could, and east and west and wherever, to get hundreds and thousands of samples of people from all the different tribes of the world that were known of DNA. And so they then sequenced the genomes of all these people, sequenced the human genome, and then went on to look at uh, the markers that we know that you know, follow maternity. And in this case, mitochondrial DNA and the markers that really show whether or not you've come from a particular woman or not. And, uh, and so as that progressed, they really realized and they concluded that everybody alive on the earth now, every human who was alive on the earth now, had to have come from one woman. Now, the naturalistic point of view would say some kind of half ape woman in Africa 200 or three, two, three million years ago. Um, but we would say that, that would be Eve. So we see scientific evidence that everybody agrees upon that everybody alive on the earth came from one woman. Now, let me see what's more plausible. That we all came from that one perfect woman, Eve, thousands of years ago, and we've only accumulated as many uh, mutations in our own body as we have. Or two to three million years ago, we couldn't have evolved from that. We would have been destroyed by all the mutations and the copies over millions of years of procreation and mutations entering our body. Because remember, mutations are 10 times more destructive than they are beneficial. And so we would have evolved ourselves into oblivion long ago if it was uh, that uh, you know, first hominoid uh, two, three million years ago. So I want to encourage you this, that we have science, we have the naturalistic worldview, we understand it, and through a biblical lens, we can know where we came from. This helps us to know that where we are going, that God made a perfect world, handed it over to us, we bought